Jesus and God came down in the garden and said, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard you coming. And I hid because I was naked. Now, the Lord answered, How did you know that you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I commanded you? not to eat. Listen, the what emphasis is I commanded you. I commanded you. Did you dare to go against that? Did you eat of the fruit that I commanded you not to eat? And Adam said, oh, it's the woman you gave me. That's not the point. It's not the circumstances. It's who have you gone against? Who have you defied? Is there room for that? The woman says, oh, it's not me. It's the serpent. Did any of those excuses stand before God? This is my prayer, beloved. That during this Africa, the Lord will restore the fear of God in our hearts. The Lord will restore the reverence of who he is. I, I, I look at Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was pleading with the Father. Oh God. All things are possible with you. Please let this cup be removed from me. But not as I will. As you will. It's all about you. My will has got no place before you. And this is what I want us to start cultivating back into into our lives. Whatever reasons come up, whatever circumstances, whatever explanations, they have no room before God. What matters is he spoke. Look, look at how he created. And he spoke. And it was. Creation bows down before him. And the Bible says he gave the sea its boundaries. When? D. At creation. And up to today the sea keeps that boundary. He made the day and the night. When? At creation. And up to today, the, the, the day and the night keep his word. Let us pray that God will give us a heart that honors him. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. I am God. I am not of your kind. Be still and just remember, I am God. Let me ask you, raise your hand to the Father. And from the bottom of your heart, talk to him. And say to the Lord, O oh God, teach me to revere your name. Teach me to honor you. Teach me to lay down my life for you. There's nothing I can ever exchange for you. Come on, go ahead, talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Lord, you hear the cry of our hearts. Forgive us where we have fallen short of glory. Forgive us where we have forgotten who you are. Forgive us where we have elevated circumstances above your name. And Father, we pray in your mercy. Revive us again. Restore the fear of God in our hearts. Restore reverence in our hearts. Make us a people who know you. A people who honor you. A people who find their strength in you. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give him a hand of praise. <laughs> Thank you.
When I listen to the words of Jesus Christ as he answered the Jews, he did not argue whether it is good or bad to heal on Sabbath. He did not argue with them theologically. He said, my father is at work. And th therefore I work. And let me tell you something. The father loves the son. He shows the son what he is doing. So that the son may do what he, the father is doing. And do it in the same manner that the father is doing it. His whole reasoning is based on the relationship between him and the father. Now, when I saw that, I determined that I want to know in my day, in my time, in my circumstances, what the father is doing. I want to be able to say to my father is at work, therefore I am at work. I want to answer the question, why do I do what I do? And I wanted to be able to say, because the Father is doing the same. And I do the same in a similar manner. So I started myself on a journey. A journey of discovery. And I was praying to the Lord. Show me what you are doing. Let me see what you are doing. In my day. In my nation. In my community, in my generation, and give me the grace to do the same. When I started out, I focused on Jesus Christ. Because I said, if Jesus is doing what the Father is doing, then I want to see what he is doing. So I started studying the life of Christ. Trying to find out what is it that Jesus is doing that will show me what the Father is doing. And at some point I found the words of Jesus Christ when he is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Holy Spirit will do nothing by himself. He will say nothing of his own. He takes what is mine and brings to you. And what is mine is of the Father. So he takes of that and brings to you. So I now concentrated on both Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But somehow I did not really click with it. I did not really see the Father at work. And then there are times when Jesus would say, I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of my Father. I would say, what, what is his will? What is he doing? So eventually I made up my mind. I said, I'm going to change my focus. I'm going to go and look for somewhere in the Bible where the Bible expressly talks about God at work. What does the Bible say expressly that the Father was doing? And I did not know where to start. So I said, I'll, I'll go back to Genesis and read from cover to cover and pray and believe that I'll find somewhere. And God is good because I did not take long. As I was reading chapter 1, then chapter 2, I found a very, very interesting word. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. It says, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. 
Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Here is the Bible expressly talking about the Father working. And it's saying he worked. So my heart was full of excitement. I said, here it is. The father at work. And I want to know what was he working. But going back to read, I was disappointed. Because everything I saw the father was doing was creation. He was creating the light and he was creating the darkness. He was creating the day. He was creating the skies and the heavens. Creating the birds and the fish of the sea and the animals of the earth. And I thought, I have no part in this. I'm not a creator. I cannot say my father is working, so I'm working. I don't know how to plug into that. And I felt disappointed. But at that, at that moment, the Holy Spirit ministered to me and said, look beyond the act of creation. God has a purpose for creation. God has a purpose for creation. And it's a long story. I won't go into the discovery, but this is what I discovered. That the Father as he was in the process of creation, he was establishing his kingdom. He was establishing his kingdom. Everything he made, he made it to abide in his kingdom. He made it according to his rules decrees and regulations. And I felt the Holy Spirit minister to my heart. That is the work of the Father. He is establishing his kingdom in all creation. That is what he started to do in creation. That is what he has always been doing. That is what he is still doing today. That is what he is doing in my nation. That is what he is doing in my generation. That is what he is doing in my community. That is what he is doing in my life. When he was creating, look at he, the way he says, let us make the sun and the moon. One is to rule in the day, the other is to rule in the night. Let us now make the firmament. Let us now make man so that he may have dominion. He was, everything was creating, was fitting into his rule. And after man sinned against him, God did not give up the idea of kingdom. He continued working for his kingdom. He continued promising that he is going to restore the kingdom. When God raised up the nations, he apportioned an inheritance to all nations for his kingdom. When he raised up Israel, he wanted to show what his kingdom looks like. He wanted all the nations to see his kingdom. So he 
established his law, his ways, and his statutes in, in Israel to show his kingdom. When he sent his son Jesus Christ, the message he brought says the kingdom of the Lord is at hand. Repent for the kingdom is near. When John the Baptist came, it was the message of the kingdom. When Jesus Christ was sending out his disciples, he gave them the message of the kingdom. When Jesus Christ was teaching, he taught the kingdom. He says, this is what the kingdom is like. In the kingdom, it is like this. In the kingdom, the ruler is the servant of the others. And he said, in the kingdom of God, these are the statutes. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter that kingdom. That kingdom has got standards. And when he sat down at the last supper, to eat with his disciples he said I have desired with all my heart to the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God someone give God the praise hallelujah Amen. it's all about the kingdom it's all about the kingdom my heart became excited. I said, I can relate with that. If the father is building his kingdom, I can build kingdom with him. I can say my father is at work. And I am at work. And I can say, Uh-oh. I know it's possible to preach and yet not be building his kingdom. I know it's possible to prophesy and in my motive I'm building my own kingdom. So I can understand now how I can engage in works of ministry and yet not be building his kingdom. So now I can understand why Jesus would say to some people, get out of my sight, you workers of iniquity. I can understand why Paul would say, Whoever is building on this foundation, be careful how you build. Some people build with gold, others with silver, others with precious stones, but others are building with wood, with hay, and rubbish. And some people's works will not go through the fire. They will be destroyed. Suddenly I realize why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I do things the way I do them? The Pharisees were ministers of God. The teachers of the law were teaching God's word. But they were not building his kingdom. What does it mean to build his kingdom? Is his rule. His authority. To come. To bring everything to submit to his authority. And his will. To be done. Wow. Mm -hmm. Amen. Go ahead. Give him the praise. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's no longer about doing proper actions or improper actions. It is what is the result of what you do. Does it bring things under his authority? Does it make him Lord over all? Does it bring all creation to bow down before him? Does it bring his will 
to be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Suddenly it's not about what do I do? It's why you do it. And how you do it. The father loves the son. He shows him what he is doing. So that the son may also do it in the same manner. Amen. Amen. Now, take a moment. Think about all the works that are being done around the world in the name of Jesus. And sincerely speaking, how much of those works really bring down everything under the authority of God? And how much of what is being done all around the world really causes his authority to abide? And how much do we do in the church? And at the end of the day, it does not point to him. It points to some great man of God. Some great woman of God. Some great ministry. Some wonderful church. And yet, he says, on that day, they will come and say, we preached in your name. We prophesied in your name. Didn't you say it, Lord? And he says, get out of my sight. Get out of my sight. You workers of iniquity. At that point, I began to pray. I said, okay, Lord, you are establishing your kingdom. Now teach me how do you build your kingdom? Because you say the father shows the son what he's doing so that the son can do it in the same manner. So show me how you are building your kingdom so that I may do it in the same manner. In the same way. Then I can say, why do I do what I do? Because my father is at work. Therefore I am at work. Does someone feel the same? Can I see your hand if you feel the same? Amen. Amen. Now, it's a, it was a long journey. But let me give you what output, what results came out of that journey. I discovered that the kingdom of God is established on six pillars. That God himself works within these six pillars. And that's the only way his kingdom is established. And now let me mention those pillars and then I will attempt to explain each of them. Just write them down. Number one, the kingdom of God is established on the will of God. On the will of God. Number two, is established on destiny. And destiny means the purpose for which God made whatever he made. Number three, the kingdom of God works with God's likeness in man through the indwelling spirit. Don't worry, we are going to explain each one of them. Number four, that the kingdom of God works through the Pervading presence of God. 
By pervading presence, we talk about the presence that fills all and is in all. Number five. The kingdom of God works with God's authority established in the spheres of in all spheres of life. And we will explain that. And number six. The kingdom of God is established to, through his purposes in the nations. Now before I explain all of this, I want to say to you something. I have been Serving God in his calling for about 20, 28 years right now. Since he put his calling on my life. And in the 28 years, and so we have developed different themes that around which we do ministry and preach. We talk about the day of the Lord. We talk about the call to be set apart unto the Lord. We talk about prayer altars. We talk about nations. We talk about spiritual warfare. We talk about prayer. And somebody could say, those are the key themes that these people are dealing with. We talk about personal destiny. We talk about corporate destiny. But somehow, it's, it's all like fragmented. It's almost like, okay, let me pull out something else. And I had never seen all of them connecting into one thing. I think the last six, seven months, suddenly I saw the jigsaw puzzle just fall together. I saw God at work. And I saw him do one thing. And all the things that he has given us over the years, he, and, and each of them, when he, when he would give us each one of them, it would burn in our hearts. It would push us with the momentum. And it would propel us forward for years. And we would go to any part of the world. Any, any part of the world. And as we shared in each of them, people testified and say, that is of God. That is the heart of God. But somehow we had never connected, oh, personally, I had never fully, fully connected. Now, in the last six, seven months, it was all falling together. So beautifully. So beautifully. Amen. So, I, I know if I took every one of these six, I could teach on it for a, a week. So, I'm not going to teach on them. I'm just going to try and explain a little bit. I hope it will be enough for you to go back and do your own exploration. Just raise your hand to the Father. And you remember all wisdom comes from him. So ask him. Open my understanding. Give me your wisdom. Your revelation. And revive my spirit. Go ahead, lift your voice and talk to him. Tell him, revive my spirit. Revive my revelation. Give. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give God a hand of praise. Now, let me begin with the will of God. When Jesus was teaching us how to pray, 
Now, remember, First John chapter 5, Verse 14 to 16 says, This is the confidence we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And when He hears us, we have what we have asked. Now that's a powerful statement. It does not leave room for doubt. There is no guesswork. He says, this is the confidence that we have in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if he hears us, we have what we have asked for. So if that is the quality of prayer that Father is looking for, it means that is the quality Jesus was teaching about prayer. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray in this manner, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is praying according to the will of God. So that is the heart of God. And Jesus says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. But only he who does the will of the Father. I was praying and asking God, what is the will of God? It's one thing to know the will of God is the pillar upon which the kingdom is established. But what is this will of God? And in my layman's mind, I thought, my will is my desire. My, my heart yearning. That which I want to be, that is my will. So what about the Father? That means the will of the Father is his heart desire. Is that which he desires to see? Is that which he calls right? And to make a long story short, I thought about this. Before God created anything, before he created heaven or earth, before he created time before the beginning he existed forever and ever and ever before the beginning because in the beginning he created heaven and earth but before the beginning he lived from eternity to eternity. Think about it. How long was he there before heaven was? Forever and ever and ever. And what did he lack? Ask your neighbor, what did he lack? God lacks nothing. God lacks nothing. And nothing can be added to him. He is all in all. Creation did not add anything to him. He could have lived forever 
by himself. Everything that pleases him is inside of him. Everything he desires is inside of him. He is all and in all. From everlasting to everlasting. He is light. He is love. He is truth. He is life. He is everything. Then I was asking myself, what is it that he wanted? What is it that he wanted so that he began to create? Now, that's a long journey. It took me weeks. And I was going through scriptures. To find out what is it that he lacked that he wanted until I came to a conclusion. He lacked nothing. But he his goodness, his sweetness, his love, his glory. And you know one thing about love? Love shares. Love enjoys to give. Love enjoys to bless. It was not because he lacked. It was because he wanted to give. He wanted to love. Yes, go ahead, give him praise. Mm, Tell your neighbor, clap unto the Lord. He created us. That he may love us. That he may bless us. That he may show us what he is. And what God is. Is the glory of God. The glory of God is what God is. And has in himself. When we say the glory came down. What are we saying? His presence came down. He made himself manifest. Where before we were not noticing that he is around. Suddenly we realize God is here. The glory came down. And I thought okay. He had a desire. The desire was to reveal himself. You know, God is a mystery. I was thinking before he made heaven. Where was he? Did he where did he live? I thought up there. But up where? I thought he lived in the universe. In the space. But he is the one who created space. He made the universe. Was he in the east or in the west? Was he in, in the north or in the south? Was he up or he was down? The Bible says. You know, when we talk about heaven, we say up there. The Bible says the name of the Lord is great above the heaven of heavens. So if there is heaven up there, the name of God is great in heaven, then it is great above the heaven of heavens and it continues beyond heaven. Say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible says Bible the name of the Lord is great beyond hades. You know the Bible talks about the bottomless pit. Think about the depth of the bottomless pit. A pit without a bottom. And the Bible says God is omnipresent. Even 
beyond the bottomless pit, he continues. If the bottomless pit has got an end, God has got no end. He is bigger than bigness. Is wider than width. Is higher than height. Is deeper than depth. What can we ever compare with him? What can we ever use to describe him? He is beyond comprehension. He is called a mystery. He is a mystery. That means you can't know him. You can't comprehend him unless he chooses to reveal himself. And the Bible says when he made a decision to reveal himself that decision that substance which contains his revelation which contains everything he is and everything he has is called Logos Logos the word of God that's why the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things made, were made by him and there's nothing that was made that was not made by him. The word of God the logos was the plan in the heart of God to reveal himself. To say, you, you cannot know me. Nobody can know me. But I'm going to reveal who I am. What I am. And what I have inside of me. The Bible says, he lives in a light that no eye can look into. Can, can you comprehend that? He lives in a light that no eye can look into. That is our God. He is a mystery. Chama. Unless he chooses to reveal himself, you cannot know him. Now, that which was in his heart, those thoughts to reveal himself, the Bible says what fills the heart, the mouth speaks. It was his word. It is that which the Bible calls his wisdom. The way he thinks. The way he sees things. What he calls right or righteousness when he speaks that which is from his heart and you receive it it is counted righteousness to you and Abraham believed God and that was counted righteousness he received the wisdom of God. The thinking of God. The way God sees things. And how do we get saved? By the word. You don't change before you get saved. You simply receive the word. The counsel from his heart. The way he says things should be. When you receive that, you get saved. The, it comes with power. It changes you. The wisdom of God is the will of God. Is the word of God. When you read in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is speaking. And he says, the Lord gave birth to me before all creation. Before he made the foundations of the earth and the heavens, I was with him. And I was his workman. Everything he did, he did by me. 
Nange. And I rejoiced in his good works. When he made the heavens, when he established the foundations of the earth and the seas, I was by his side. And he called me his own. Wisdom says, he who finds me finds life. And he who hates me loves death. The word of God, the wisdom of God, the will of God is life. And he who misses it is dead. The word of God, the will of God, the wisdom of God is the way that God says things should be. If you go out of that, the Bible says you are lost. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, all of us were lost in our own ways. And when he came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes to the Father except he goes through me. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the word of God. The Bible says it pleased the Father that all his fullness, all his Godhead should dwell in him. All creation is held together by the might of his word. All things consist in him. He is all and in all. All things were made by him and for him. He is the express image of the Father. He is the express revelation of the Father. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. For the Father is in me and I am in him. Now, we could go on for a week just talking about that. The will of God is God's desire to reveal who he is what he has in himself. It is the express manifestation of the glory of God. Of the love of God. And of the standard of God. Anybody who rejects the will of God rejects God. Anybody who thinks the word of God is not right is thinking God is not right. Do you remember the book of Hebrews? Chapter 10. Jesus says, Offerings and sacrifice you did not allow me. So, he, here I come to do your will, O God. He was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. But offerings and sacrifice the father did not require of him. So he says, so what do I bring you? Here I come to do your will. To do your will. Beloved, go back. Read the Bible. 
is the one thing he requires. You miss that? It doesn't matter what else you do. Everything else. Because the will of God is the expression of his heart desire. And he says, you were the model of perfection. You know what models are? When a designer wants to show you what they have made, they find a model. A model that will walk before you and you think, I want that. And the Bible says of Lucifer, you are the model of perfection. Perfect in wisdom. Do you hear that? Perfect in wisdom. What does that mean? Every thought of your heart was like the thought of God. You are perfect in his wisdom. Now do you remember what the Bible says Genesis chapter 6 and God saw that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. But here was Lucifer and the Bible says you walked between the fiery stones of God. On the mountain of the Lord. Before the great assembly of heaven. And then the Bible says. And you were perfect. Until the day that you corrupted your wisdom. Now, think about that. What does it mean? At first. You're perfect in wisdom. It means you think exactly the way God thinks. Then you corrupted your wisdom. That means you departed from the way God thinks. You started thinking thoughts that God does not think. You started departing from the way of the Lord. From the counsel of God. From the word of God. From the truth of God. From the light. And what, the Bible, what does the Bible say? And I banished, banished you. From my presence. Do you hear that? God is saying, what you were doing was you were rejecting me. You were denying me. You were made for me. All things are made by him and for him. And suddenly this creature is denying God. What is the Wages of doing that. The wages of sin. Death. What is sin? He who knows what is good to do. And does not do it. That is sin. For sin is rebellion. Please, please, please connect with this. The only response that God had for Lucifer and all the angels that followed his corrupt wisdom was judgment eternal death 
eternal death. Kufa ukutagwao. Now listen. In the garden of Eden, Eden, how did Satan tempt man? Satan He said, God knows. If you eat of that fruit, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. And verse 6 of chapter 3, Genesis says, When the woman saw that the fruit was good to eat, pleasing to the eye and desirable to bring wisdom. What? Wisdom. She took and ate. God's wisdom says when you eat you shall die. Her wisdom has changed. She thinks when I eat, I'll be like God. That is sin. That is the end. When God comes, he says, have you eaten of the fruit I commanded you? Do you remember? I commanded you not to eat not to eat I mean, that is it. Have you eaten of the fruit I commanded you? Now let me tell you something. As we are winding up. When Satan sinned and departed from the wisdom of God. Now, I was meditating on this. Who tempted Lucifer? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Who tempted the angels? And if nobody tempted the angels, but they hatched it in their hearts, and they were banished from the presence of God. What proof do we have that those who remained will not one day do the same thing? Nobody tempted them. It came out of them. How do we know that others will not do the same? And God decided, I'm going to solve that problem once and for all. I'm not going to destroy Lucifer. Lucifer, I'm going to leave him and I want him to do what he wants. Let the other, the angels watch and compare the two ways. The way of the Lord and the way of corrupt wisdom. The way in the will of God and the way outside the will of God. And God decided I'm going to use a creature. I'm going to make a creature that will prove my will is life. Departure from my will is death. And that creature is called man. And I'm going to put him on earth. But earth is not his eternal home. Earth is his field of assignment. After earth, he will come and live with me in heaven. Guru. But while he's on earth, I'm going to make him exposed to my will and to the will of Satan. Every decision he makes, he will eat the fruit of that. And the angels in heaven will watch and see whatever circumstance Whatever opportunity, I will allow them to watch. And they will see every decision 
But I will sell out corner and the end of it. Nechina vanga mukusala woko. Those men that will turn away from my will will follow Satan to his judgment. But those who will stand before me, they will prove to the angels that my will is life. That is why the Bible says we shall judge the angels. Amen. Why? Because we are here as witnesses. We are here to bring proof. To bring witness that God's word is life. And the departure from it is death. That is why. Have you ever wondered? The Bible says. The lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth were laid. God knew. This creature I'm going to put here. Is going to fall. But since I am the one putting him in that situation, I will prepare salvation for him. I will redeem him. But not by force. By choice. He still has to choose my will. When he chooses my will, I bring him back to life. Beloved, from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, God was saying to man, I am putting before you life and death. Choose life and you will live. Choose death, you will die. That tree, don't touch, don't eat. That is my word. My will. You go against that. You will die. When man dies. Does God lose? He loses because he loves him. But. What God wants to prove. He is proving. Is proving to all heaven. There is no life outside my will. Watch. There is no life outside my will. I pray the Lord brings this to you. It means you and I and all men are on earth. God says choose. You will eat the fruit of what you choose. Whichever way you go, his purposes are being fulfilled. And let me say something else. When he banished Lucifer from heaven, God did not forgive Lucifer. God did not prepare salvation for Lucifer. God could have destroyed him there and then. But God wanted to prove through all generations there is no alternative to his will. So he said, I will not judge him now. But I will prepare a day. A day. When I have proved my point. And on that day. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. That I am the Lord. And when that day comes. All who chose rebellion. All who departed from the will. Will go into it destruction. That is what we call the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. That day was not set after man sinned. It was when the angels sinned. We are on earth 
I, I pray the Holy Spirit opens our understanding. Do you know the Bible says we are witnesses? A witness brings proof. That's why the Bible says whether you pass through fire or water I'll be with you. Why does he want us to pass through fire? To say to the angels watch him. Even when circumstances are bad, my will is the only option. Do you, do you remember the story of Job? God said, Have you seen Job? Have you seen how he holds on to his integrity? And certain says, Oh, come on, do this to him, and then you see he will curse you. And God says, You think so? I'm going to do it. But watch him. Do you remember what we read yesterday? Some will be, some will fall. Some will be given to the sword, to the flames, to persecution, not to destroy them, but that they may bring forth the, the witness. Daniel, Daniel, they threw him in the den of lions. He could have died. But God says, watch him. If he chooses me, you will see. There is no life outside my will. Daniel chose the will of God. And he closed the mouths of lions. Message Shadrach and Abednego. Message Shadrach and Abednego. He said, we'll throw you in the fire. God says, okay. Okay, let them be thrown in. And I will show you there is no life outside my will. If they stick to my will, they will reign. And one day they will stand with me to judge all creation that departed from my will. Think about it. Whatever you are going through, you may even think, this is too much. I'm tired. I'm fed up. Wait a moment. You are a witness. It's not about comfort. It's not about convenience. It's about, will you stand? and prove the will of God? Will you show you are for God? Will you stand in those circumstances? You know, in the book of Ephesians, Paul says, I, whom, who is the least of all apostles, I was given this mystery. Mystery. Say with me, mystery. To reveal the manifold wisdom of God. That now, the wisdom of God shall be made manifest to the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world through the church. Do you, do you hear that? Paul is saying God is going to put you in all kinds of circumstances. But what he wants in every situation stand and show the principalities and the powers and the, and the rulers of the darkness the wisdom of God the will of God is life. Is life. Let the Devil come at you like a flood. When you stand in the will of God, God will show. Now, now listen, listen. Listen. Even when you die, God will stand and say, You look, you see, He knows what eternal life is. Jesus says, He, he who is in Christ, even when He dies, He shall be alive. Hallelujah. Amen.
What God wants is not convenience or inconvenience. It's not wealth or poverty. It's not comfort or discomfort. He says whatever the situation stand and let the principalities and powers and the rulers of this world test you and I just want you to be my witness that my will is life. But not only the principalities and powers let the angels look so that none of them will ever choose to depart from the will of God. Let them watch you. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter that we have been called to tread where angels fear to tread. There are circumstances God will push us into and he says fear not. I am with you. And the angels will tremble and look at us and say, oh my God. And when you walk through those circumstances in the will of God, all angels turn around and say, blessed be the name of the Lord who was, who is, who shall be. This is what it's all about. When we say the will of the, the day of the Lord is coming, that day has got only one standard. The will of God. On that day, the angels will bow down to the sons and daughters of God who never compromised. And they will bow down. And they will say, Blessed be the Lamb. He deserves the glory. For he redeemed a people unto himself. And brought them into glory. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, brothers, listen. The devil does not come but to steal, to kill to destroy. Nowadays, the devil has brought in doctrines in the church where he says to the people of God, God loves you. You don't have to fully obey. You will never do anything that is bigger than his love. That is bigger than his grace. You can do what you want. You are saved not by works. But by the grace. So there are people in the church. That are living outside God's will. And they believe they will go to heaven. Not everybody who says Lord Lord. Will enter heaven. But only he. Who does the will of God. Check your heart. What is it that wears you out? What is it that you say this is too much? When you say something is too much, you are denying God. Because God, the Bible says, God is faithful who will never allow you to be tested beyond what you can manage. But behind every trial, he puts a way out. So when you think this is too much, you are saying he's not faithful. He has put you into temptation greater than what you can manage. We are giving up on one another today. I can't take this anymore. But God can take all you can, all you offer him. All the rebellion, the defiance, the straying away. He can bear with you. But we do not bear with one another. I've had enough. I've had enough. I've had enough. I'll walk away. I'll walk away. I'll go my way. Is, are 
Think about it. Witness. You will be my witness. In Jerusalem. In Judea. In Judea in Samaria. In Samaria. The ends of the earth. What does witness do? That he is the way. The truth. And the life. And I chose him. When I give up on love. Am I still a witness? No. Oh. Uh, uh. I, I, I don't know. I feel human words are so light. They don't bring it out. This is what the day of the Lord is all about. For this, you will sacrifice anything. You will endure anything. The Bible says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. When you know this, even when things are difficult, for the sake of His will, I will endure. I will go through this. When it is all over, I will be a witness that His will is life. His will is life. Beloved, today, check your heart and think about what are those things that cause you to turn away from the will of God. From the way of God. From the standard of God. The Bible says in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. What is it that is taking away your love? What is it that you say this is too much? I can be justified to break fellowship. I can be just fine. To turn away from love. Why did he create us? To love us. That we may also love others as he has loved us. When you turn away from that, death is the only law we have. Beloved, when you the deeper you go into this, you can understand what Jesus says, my father is at work and I am at work. So ask yourself, was it God's will that I did? If it is, everything else fades away. Beloved, I want to end on this point. The kingdom of God is established on six pillars. Each pillar is amazing. It's amazing. But when you see it, when you understand it, you can walk through every detail of life. Able to say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I do it the way I do it? Even when all your heart wants to go another way, you can say, because of him. I will go this way. I will endure. We are called to be witnesses of the mystery of God's wisdom. God's will. God's word. God's counsel. When you see it like that, suddenly, the Bible says, those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. You are going to discover in every situation the Spirit is there to say, this is the way of the Lord. That is not His way. Don't do that. Don't go there. That is not his way. This is his way. And those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. My father is at work. Therefore, I am working. Amen. 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 Give glory to God.